How did a New York Jew raised in a very conservative Jewish home end up living in Texas and believing in Jesus as his Messiah? For the very fascinating story about one man's journey from the Star of David to the cross of Jesus, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I'm delighted to have as my special guest this week a dear friend of mine named Stu Slackman. Stu, welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Thank you, Dave. Glad to be here. Well, thank Glad you. Glad to be here. And as always, I'm blessed to have my colleague, Nathan Jones. Nathan is our web minister, and he is here to help me interview Stu. Welcome, Nathan. Well, it's always great to be here, Dave. Thank you. Well, our special guest today, Stu Slackman, is a businessman who lives in the Dallas, Texas area. He owns a highly successful business that trains people in sales. He's the author of a book about sales that has a very clever title. The title is, Don't Just Stand There, Sell Something. <laughs> but the most important thing that you need to know about Stu is that he is a Jewish believer in Jesus. Which brings us back to the question I opened with. How did a New York Jew raised in a very conservative Jewish home end up living in Texas and believing in Jesus as his Messiah? Stu, let's start with your upbringing. Tell us about the home you grew up in, the relig religious training that you received. Well, actually it started in Yonkers at the age of five. I started going to the temple with my family. Now that's a Yonkers, New York. That's Yonkers, uh, New York. It's just above Manhattan Island? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And I went to Lincoln Jewish Community Center and uh, started Hebrew school in sixth grade. I mean <laughs> si six years old. Six years old. Six years old. And uh, just followed all the traditions. Did you go to synagogue regularly? Every Saturday. Yeah. Every Saturday. But by the time I was nine years old, ten years old, I figured out that I could play basketball instead of go to the synagogue. <laughs> and then when it was done, if it was a bar mitzvah, I would go in so I could eat the food. There you go. <laughs> so me and my brothers would play basketball because our parents didn't go. Oh. They just sent us off. We went by ourselves. Well, now how did they justify that? They already been there. They, oh. They've already. So they already knew all the customs, and it, right. this was for you to go and learn the customs. This was that was it. It was not an idea of getting into a personal relationship with God. No, no. It was all about the traditions, the holidays, following the holidays, having a kosher home. Those were the important things that I remember. So you grew up in a very conservative. Yes. kosher home that yes. honored the Jewish traditions. Yeah, my grandfather, uh, Grandpa Willie on my mother's side, my mother's father, was actually Orthodox. Hmm. Oh. And I'll actually say today that my faith has a lot to do with my grandfather who was my mentor. He would bring me to the Orthodox temple when I would visit him in Brooklyn, and we'd sit on the right side, and the women were on the left. <laughs> oh, and this would, was really an Orthodox congregation. Yeah, and there was no, there was no English, not one word of English. Well, all Yiddish? 100% Hebrew. Oh, and right. I would have to follow him in the prayer book, which is the Siddur. Yeah. And I would just follow him along. So and this would be like going to a Catholic church years ago where right. everything was in Latin. Right, exactly. <laughs> So, I mean, I was steeped in Orthodox. So, you Judaism did have a member of your family who was very interested in spiritual things. Yes, he was. I know that from your, the book that you mm -hmm. uh, wrote about this, and which we're going to talk about more in the program, yeah. that he really had a tremendous impact on your life. He did. Now, your mother, I read something in your book that just absolutely, I was rolling on the floor laughing. <laughs> tell, me, tell me about your, your mother. You, you, you have a statement in your book that your mother's laws overruled the laws of Leviticus. Now, yes. tell us about that. Well, I was 16 years old and we were eating out at the East Bay Diner in Oceanside, and all of a sudden my mother orders an omelet with bacon. Bacon? And you can't eat bacon, it's not kosher. You're not allowed to eat pork. And I go, Mom, what are you doing? Bacon's not kosher. And she goes, it's okay, we're out of the house. <laughs> and I'm going, really? Because she was the one in the first place who told me I'm not allowed to eat any pork products. 
Another thing I noticed in your book that I, I enjoyed was that you were you really evidently got into the scriptures because you were in a Bible um, yeah. uh, contest. Yeah. Uh, in your last year of Hebrew school. Yes. And it had questions like this. I, I, I yeah. should ask these of Nathan. <laughs> Nathan, Uh-oh. are you ready? All right. What was David's third wife's second son's name? David's third wife's second, second son's, son's name. Or name the next three kings who ruled after King Hezekiah. Or what were Jacob's six sons' children's names? <laughs> Six now, th- those were the kind of questions, yeah. and you did well in that, didn't you? Yeah, I got an honorable <laughs> mention. I got an honorable mention. It's like, how did that? In fact, I still have the book today that they gave me as a gift, which is a, a Jewish commentary on all the Jewish principles. Well, you, you make a comment in your book that mm-hmm. I want you to elaborate on. You, yeah. Right after this, you say, What the Bible contest did not test was my understanding of our faith. Right. If it had, I probably would have failed. Right. Truth to be told, all my years of Hebrew education did not bring me into a clearer concept of or closer relationship with Almighty God. Right. So, yeah. it's one thing to know about the Bible, but it's another thing to know God. Yeah, it was, it was all about knowledge. Uh, when you grow up in a Jewish home, the most important thing is education. To be well-versed to, to know things, to learn, to excel in school, to get straight A's, to go to a good college, to get a good profession, to make a lot of money. That is success in life. You know, uh, we had uh, Marty Getz. I don't know if you know Marty or not, but we had Marty yeah. Getz uh, as, at one of our conventions. He's a great uh, J- Jewish Christian musician. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, he made that very same point. He said, you know, when you grow up in a Jewish home, it's, son, are you going to be a doctor? Are you going to be a Boy, lawyer? Exactly. Uh, are you going to be a big time businessman? And he says, Mama, I'm going to be a Christian piano player. <laughs> it didn't go over very well. That doesn't go over well. <laughs> so, so the, the emphasis is really on wealth, right? Right. Yeah. And like I say in the book, my mother would guilt me into whatever it is I should be doing. <laughs> That's why I say my mother worked for the largest travel agency in New York City. Oh. She was vice president of guilt trips. Is that right? <laughs> guilt trips. Oh, I say guilt trips. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's why I was an engineer. I went to a good college, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and oh, yeah. they said, you got to be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer. And I have cousins, two cousins that are lawyers, two that are engineers. One went to Harvard and to Rensselaer, two to Columbia. So, you must be really considered a failure by your family. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Sales? <laughs> well, you know, uh, what's fascinating to me is how in the world you get from Yonkers, New York, and later Long Beach, New York, where you lived, yep. uh, to uh, Dallas, Texas, of all places, yeah. and then end up finding the Messiah in your life. And in just a moment, we yep. want, to, want you to tell us that story, sure. okay? Sure. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy. We're interviewing Stu Schlackman about his journey from the Star of David to the Cross of Christ. And he's been telling us about this strict Orthodox Jewish childhood in New York. (laughs) Now, Stu, you were telling us a little about your college. Could you tell us also why you decided to go into sales? And how did that bring you to Jesus as your Messiah? Well, it's kind of funny. I mean, life is a journey. And uh, so I went to college to study engineering. And I was an engineer for seven years. And then I really didn't like it, and I got tired of New York City, and I left and I moved to Boston to live with some good friends. And then a good friend of mine, John Cavazangian, hires me into Digital Equipment Corporation, and the next thing you know, they say, you know, you should be in sales. I say, <laughs> I can't imagine nah, how they figured yeah, that yeah. out. <laughs> and it, was a, it was a riot, so this guy from Birmingham, Bob Baines, I get to be friends with him. Hmm. Next thing you know, he's promoted to sales manager in Birmingham, and things were shaking up at corporate headquarters. I was working in Merrimack, New Hampshire, and Bob says, why don't you go into the internal sales development program and come live in Birmingham? And at the time, I was recently married, and we had our first son, Greg, and I know that my wife, Debbie, at the time was not happy in the North, and she wanted to get back to Dallas. That's where she was from. Mm -hmm. So, I said, we'll go to Birmingham, and eventually we'll get to Dallas. So, Bob hires me to move there, but while we were in New Hampshire, he says, Stu, I hear you're Jewish. I said, yeah, I am. He says, 
I'm very intrigued about that. Tell me about it. Now, nobody in my life ever said that. Mm -hmm. Usually it's anti-Semitism. You're Jewish? Yeah. What is wrong with you? But, That's you know, right. I grew up in a, a town that was totally Jewish, so I was comfortable yeah. in my own environment. So we ended up moving down to Birmingham, and then one night I'm having dinner with Bob and Greg Christian, and Greg Christian is a biblical scholar. Come and we had a two and a half hour dinner over Mexican food, and Greg is telling me everything about the Bible from Genesis to the book of Revelation, which I knew nothing about. Wow. And he's, he's focusing on the issue of sin. And mm -hmm. I say, I know about sin. That's why we have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So my sins are forgiven. <laughs> and it was like a month later, because it was in October, he says, so you fasted last month on Yom Kippur. I said, no, nah, not this year. <laughs> But one thing led to another, and Bob invites me to his church, which is Shades Mountain Baptist Church. We're sitting in a class. He takes me to a class. They're studying Second Kings. And, you know, I'm listening, and I'm poking him. I say, he's wrong. He's wrong. Really? And, I, I mean, I studied the Bible because I was in a Bible contest. Yeah, speaking Hebrew. And all of a sudden, the teacher says, excuse me, what's going on back there? And Bob pokes me. He says, tell him. I said, I'm not going to tell him. And Bob says... He's Jewish. <laughs> and I thought I was going to be killed. And they all turned around again, looked at me like I was a celebrity. <laughs> you know, and the next thing you know, um, the, the turning point for me was in a hotel. It was a Holiday Inn in Hoover, Alabama. One night I decided to open up the, the yeah. side drawer and I see a Bible in there. And I open uh, up the Bible. Gideon Bible. And, uh, yeah, the Gideon Bible. I'm looking at mm -hmm. it. I see Exodus, Deuteronomy, <laughs> Leviticus. And then all of a sudden, I turn halfway through, a little more than halfway through, and it says the New Testament of Jesus Christ. I go, what is this doing in my Bible? That's supposed to be Bible? a sin for an Orthodox yeah. Jew to even read it. I know. <laughs> I go, what is this doing in my Bible? Oh, oh, dear. Then I, I turn, I see Matthew, Mark, Luke. I go, <laughs> then I see the book of Hebrews. I go, that's, that's got to be a good one. <laughs> that's a yeah. good book. <laughs> and then this voice <laughs> says to me, this voice actually says to me, so you believe the first part, you don't believe the second part, are you calling me a liar? Wow. Wow. That, I mean, really, that voice, and I said, to, okay, why would I say that to myself? <laughs> <laughs> that can't be me. And then, I, then I, I, I said, okay, let's apply some logic. Okay, both books are in the same binder, why? <laughs> and really, okay, so I, do I believe the first part, the Old Testament? Yes. Well, who am I to decide that the second part is false based on just my upbringing? Logical. Logical. Then I said, I need to explore this. And then after visiting with Bob and going to Shades Mountain, then we decided to go to a Church of Christ where my wife was from. And one night they visit me at the house on a Monday night after I go to church on Sunday. And they started studying with me on the prophecies. Hmm. And the prophecies amazed me. Okay, so this person of Jesus Christ rode into town on a donkey, was sold, betrayed for 30 silver coins, was born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, and was crucified in Psalm 22 before crucifixion existed. Mm -hmm. How is that possible? And then the verse that got me, actually it's, it's in the book on page 95 or 94, I believe, is this. This is what really got me in 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. It says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they carried along the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Great I, verse. I mean, it's like, Great verse. And, and, and the funny thing is, the way we start the book in the introduction is the second sentence is 1 John 5, 9 through 11 which is we accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which He has given about His Son. Anyone who believes in the Son as God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar. Wow. And that was the voice that came to me in the hotel room in Birmingham. And, and it, it was just like about seven years ago that I realized that that scripture existed. Mm. And it's like, from that point on, I mean, it was only a few weeks later that I walked down the aisle on a Wednesday night and was baptized. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, now, one thing that, uh, that Praise the Lord. Uh, intrigued me about this was the importance of one-on-one -on -one personal evangelism yes. by friends yeah. who didn't try to hit you over the head uh -huh. with the Bible or condemn you or, 
argue with you, yeah. but just witness to you. That, th- Bob Baines was a friend. He was my manager. He nurtured me. He mentored me. Bobby Thomas, who worked in the office, was an- another very strong Baptist. And he was gentle and kind. We were good friends. We went on a lot of road trips together. And we just, he would, he would talk to me about the person of Jesus and it was never pushing it on me. He never condemned my faith. He was admired by it. And really, that was an attraction to these people. And what they represented, I said, I got to have some of that. I mean, really. <laughs> it was like, I've, I, I grew up in New York City, in that area, where everybody is judgmental. I heard my relatives talk about the other relatives. I'm saying, I wonder what they're saying <laughs> yeah. about me in, in the background. Yeah. Really? Everybody had a nickname. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, so-and-so the coffer, so-and-so the miser, so-and-so this. You know, <laughs> unbelievable. So would you say then that Bible prophecy and the voice of the Lord is what led you? That was, again, that was friends, definitely course, part of it. I, I felt yeah. the scriptures talk to me. And of course in Corinthians wow. it says that there's a veil over the eyes of the Jewish people. Mm-hmm. But that veil is lifted when you read the new scriptures, yes. the New Testament. And I, for some reason uh, the mm-hmm. New Testament, the scriptures that I read brought life. Let, let, let me uh, share yeah. something with you. I, I go to Israel a lot and yeah. I know a lot of Jewish people. Uh, some of whom, like our guides over there, really know the Bible, but it's all up here and right. not here. And one thing they say to me over and over that I find so interesting, I'll say to them, do you have a personal relationship with the Lord? And they'll say, oh, you don't understand. Jewish people cannot have a personal relationship with the Lord. Our relationship is a national relationship, not a personal relationship. Does that, yes. does that ring a bell with you? Yeah. It's more of a culture and a nationality than a faith. It's, see, it's a religion, not a faith. Yeah. Because faith is putting your hope in something else. Yeah. He, my favorite verse is Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. Mm-hmm. That's what faith is all about. Yeah. It's having faith that this person of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, died on a cross for my sins and was raised on the third day. He was resurrected. I never saw it, but it's in the book. And you can truly believe that you can have, in fact you know, a personal relationship with Him. Yes, and, Absolutely. And, and that's one of Absolutely. the things that sets Christianity apart from all other religions in the world. It's one of many things, but one of them is the fact that you can have a personal relationship with God, whereas others yes. in Islam, God is aloof and distant and right. arbitrary. And, mm-hmm. and I know that Muslims tell me the one thing that really brings them to uh, Christianity is when they start reading something, uh, the Gospels, and they read about the love of God. Mm-hmm. Right. Because Allah has many, many names in the Quran, but mm-hmm. never is He called a God of love. Right. He's a stern, judgmental God. But the true God is a God of love. And in fact, in Islam, it, it, that God could decide at the last minute whether oh, yeah. or not He'll let you into heaven right. Right. For, yeah. for His own reasons. <laughs> and like, another big difference, of course, between Christianity and world religion, and Judaism in particular, is uh, works, the whole idea. Right. Where, you know, I have actually read ads in the Jerusalem Post where it would say, the chief rabbinate of Israel has decided the following family is in desperate need. We have therefore decided that anyone who contributes a hundred dollars or more to this family will receive eternal life. Wow! It, it's it's, like a, it's a works worse. salvation. And and Jesus. didn't that something that impress you about Christianity? Yes. That it's not works, right? In it's, fact, what do you say in your book about it's, that? It's grace. I say in the old in the book we say the Old Testament that works lead to faith. In the New Testament, faith leads to works. That's right. That's great. Yeah. It, what a, what a difference! What a relief to know that. You know, it's like going to 10th grade geometry, and where I grew up, it's like you study hard and, and hopefully you will get an A in Excel. But in Christianity, you walk into the class, everybody gets an A. <laughs> okay, now learn geometry. And my attitude is I'm so thankful I got an A, now I want to learn it. <laughs> Welcome back to our interview of Stu Schlackman, a Jewish man from New York who found his Messiah in Alabama and now lives in the Dallas, Texas area. Stu, could you tell a Jewish person today about your faith in Jesus? Wow, and I have. Here's what I would say, and really this is emotional for me, but it touches my heart more than anything else. First of all, the Jewish people are God's chosen. God never left His people, and the Bible talks about that. I never converted, and I never left my Judaism. I called myself a completed Jew, because the story kept on going. The Old Testament ends at the book of Malachi, 
and then 400 years later, the Messiah comes. The Old Testament has the Messiah throughout. The scriptures about the Messiah, you cannot ignore it because God has a plan for everybody. And the thing is, this life is going to end and there is an eternity and there is also one that you don't want to be in. And God has a plan for salvation for everybody that comes through the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua. It is wrong for a Jewish person to not believe that God is not sending a Messiah. And that Messiah, I truly know, without beyond a shadow of a doubt, is his son, Yeshua, Jesus. So one of the points that you would make in talking with a mm-hmm. Jewish person is that you have not rejected your Jewish heritage, your, no. your background, that you have completed it, you have fulfilled yes. it yes. by accepting the Jewish Messiah yes. who is Yeshua. Yes. You're a Jew born anew as Marty Getz likes to yeah. say. Yeah. You can be Jewish and a believer right. in I, I, at the same time. I mean I don't practice yeah. the holidays anymore but did I, did I deny any part of the Old Testament? Mm. No. So I am. I was brought up Jewish. I have Jewish blood. I believe in Genesis to Malachi. There's nothing in those scriptures that I have negated or denied. It's just that that book. I mean, there's three reasons for the Old Testament. It's the point. To, first of all, to point to a Messiah. Second of all, the book of Leviticus. All the sacrifices was to wean the children of Israel off of idolatry. But the main reason was to say you can't keep the law. You're sinners. And you need the Messiah. So I believe that the Messiah came and his name is Jesus. And, And that's what the New Testament is about. It's a book about God's love for his creation. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And in fact, uh, uh, most Jews grow up being taught and believing that the New Testament is a Gentile book. Right. But the New Testament is a very Jewish book. It's written by Jewish people. It's all about yeah. Jewish culture. It's 100%. about a Jewish Messiah. That 100%. Every member of the original church was a Jew. Right. Absolutely. And yet, one of the tragedies of the church over 2,000 years is that much of the church has taught that because uh, of they, they would label the Jews as Christ killers and say right. that because they killed Christ, right. God washed His hands of them and has no purpose left for the Jewish people. Totally but you know false. as well as I do that Romans 9-11 through 11 teaches right. that is an absolute lie. Right. That God still loves the Jewish people. Yes. That He has, still has a plan for them and He is going to bring a great remnant to salvation that's in the right. end times. In fact that's already started. Did you know in the 1967 when the Six Day War began there was not one single Messianic congregation on planet Earth. Did you know today there's over five Hundred, and they're still wow. growing. They're, they're wow. all over Israel. They're all over the United States. Something and happened in 1967. The Holy Spirit was poured out, and what happened was that young Jews, in particular, began to turn to uh, Yeshua mm-hmm. as their Messiah yes. in unprecedented numbers. The remnant is already coming to the Lord. Yeah, yeah, and that's in Romans 11. Actually, <laughs> I, I, it's amazing. I, I've I've met more people uh, like Debbie that grew up. Well, now who is Debbie? Debbie Pope is my writer. She the, she has uh, she took brought, your manuscript and edited it. She brought it to life. Yes, she is incredible, but she has the same background as I do. And I want to I want to compliment her because I read your manuscript in its raw form. <laughs> yeah, and, no. uh, here it comes. <laughs> And yep. she took it and edited it yeah. and, and never took your personality out of it. Right. I mean, it, it's a fantastic book called From the Star to the Cross. And uh, the subtitle is Accepting the Promised Path from mm-hmm. Judaism into Christianity. Yes. And we're going to tell people how to get a copy of this book sure. in a few moments. But what, what does that subtitle mean, Accepting the Promised Path from Judaism into Christianity? I believe that God's promise is through His Son, Jesus, Yeshua. And that it's a path. It's a journey through life that we all take. At some point in everybody's life, we're all on a path. The Holy Spirit convicts everyone of sin. And that's in John 6, verse 44. So everybody at some point in their life has to say, what is the purpose and meaning of life? And, and really it's preparation for eternity. Yeah. And I believe we're all on this path. And the promised path is one that if you grew up a Jew as I did, the promised path is his son, the Messiah. Because the Jewish people always believed in a Messiah. You know, uh, Stu, you mentioned earlier in our interview the importance of prophecy and bringing you mm-hmm. to an understanding of Jesus as the Messiah. And I, I don't think that can be emphasized too strongly. I, I met a, a Jewish fellow one time at IRS agent who came to my house to review my income taxes. And, uh, <laughs> and he got there and he said, you know, I, 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 they put your folder in the wrong pile because I, I, when I called you and made this interview, uh, you were in the, in the real 
high, high uh, a pile of, of people who probably have cheated. And he said, I looked at it and you're just fine. So he said, uh, I said, well, fine. Can we just call this? No, I've got an hour set aside, so let's talk. He said, uh, do you believe the signs of the times indicate that Jesus is coming soon? I said, excuse me, I thought your name was Goldstein. Yeah. He said, well, yeah, but I'm a, I'm a Jewish believer. Wow. Wow. And I said, well, wow. how did you become a believer? He said, a guy knocked on my door one day and said, do you know Jesus? And I said, no. And he said, well, let me tell you about it. And he took the Hebrew Scriptures, right. my Scriptures, and showed me the prophecies and talked about yep. Jesus fulfilling them. And he said, nobody had ever done that. You know, it seemed to me that's, that's the best way to, to, yes. to testify to a, Jew, uh, to a Jew because they, they're, they're skeptical of the New Testament, but show them the prophecies right. and how Jesus fulfilled them. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Didn't that have a tremendous impact on you? Oh, it did. Starting in Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 and 80, a prophet will come like me. You know, let's go to, how about... That's uh, Moses Gen speaking there. Right. Genesis 49.10, the, tr the scepter will not leave the tribe of Judah. Oh, it, I mean, it goes on and on. Psalm, Psalm 2. And you have many of those prophecies yeah. listed in your book. Embedded in the book of Psalms is so much about David and the Messiah coming. And look at Isaiah 53. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it depicts Jesus perfectly. Psalm 22. So perfectly yeah. that it is not read in synagogues. Right. It goes from Isaiah 52 when they read the Haftorah to Isaiah they 54. They absolutely skip that chapter yes. because it is so detailed about the Messiah. Yeah. Exactly about the way he would be suffering and would die for our sins and so forth. Gambling uh, of his clothes. You know, you know what happened? This was amazing. But when my brother Jay died, he was buried by a Hasidic Jewish rabbi. And, I, and the rabbi knew I was a Christian at this point. And I said to him, so I said, can I ask you one question? And he said, yeah. What do you think of Isaiah 53? He looked at me with these piercing eyes and said this, idolatry. And that kind of stopped the discussion right there. But you know what he was saying? What he was saying is there is nothing between God and man. But who has the right to say that? Well, Stu, I hate to bring this to a close, yeah. but our time is up. And folks, uh, Stu has put his remarkable story in the form of a book entitled From the Star to the Cross. It's wonderfully written. You'll be laughing one moment, crying the next. It's the kind of book that will have uh, that you just can't put out. It's also illustrated with some great photographs of his family. And I love particularly his picture of him at 13 in, in his bar mitzvah. Uh, and here's a message that will tell you how you can get a copy. From the Star to the Cross. It's not only a fascinating book to read, but it's also a powerful witnessing tool you can share with friends, family, and co-workers. Stu's Journey to Faith presents compelling evidence that faith in Jesus is 100% compatible with Judaism. Christianity is not another religion apart from Judaism. It is the culmination of Judaism. Use this book to influence those you care about. You may receive a copy of this book for a gift of $10 or more plus shipping. Call the number you see on the screen anytime, Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time, or order online at lamblion.com. Ask for offer number P78. I want to personally invite you to attend our annual Bible conference that we are going to host in Dallas, Texas area the last week in June on Friday and Saturday the 24th and 25th. The theme of the conference will be Christianity in Crisis. It will begin on Friday evening, June 24th, with a concert by the great Christian recording artist Dallas Home. The conference will be free of charge, but is necessary for you to register. You can find the registration information on our website at lamblion.com, or you can call us at 972-736-3567. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.